Hello and welcome to another WJCA level physics question. This time it's question 6 from June 2017's unit 4. Uh, this is the option for AC theory, AC circuits. To start with we've got a coil rotated in a magnetic field and a square coil has got n turns and a cross sectional area A and we've got to use Faraday's law to explain why the EMF is proportional to the angular velocity of the coil. So what we can say here is, first of all, referencing to Faraday's law, which tells us that an EMF is induced. And that's directly proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage. Now we're going to show that that uh, size of that induced EMF is proportional to the angular velocity of the coil. Now the best way of doing this, or the most convincing proof for me, is to use Faraday's law equals dn phi by dt. Technically there's a minus in there because of Lenz's law, but we're not too worried about that. Phi is AB cos theta. But theta is omega t as it shows on the diagram. And if you know your differentiation, if you're doing a level mass, you know that if we differentiate a cosine function, we get a sine function, but also a, an extra omega will appear at the front due to the chain rule. So this becomes NAB omega sine omega t. And in other words, E is proportional to omega because N and A and B, they're all constants. And you'll notice on the next part, it says the peak induced EMF in a rotating coil is given by E equals omega BAN, which is basically this part that we got at the front of our expression with the sine omega t varying between plus one and minus one. Then an experiment is carried out to investigate the variation in peak EMF with area A by using coils with different cross-sectional areas, and we get the following graph is obtained. And we've got to discuss the agreement of the graph with the, uh, with the equation for the peak EMF and suggest a reason for any disagreement. So what we're saying is that that same derivation we've got is that that peak EMF will be directly proportional to the area because the omega to B and the N are constants. And at first, we have a straight line through the origin showing that. Now the curve in at the end shows that once we get to a certain area, then we're no longer in agreement with that expression. And that could simply be that once the coil gets too big, it's outside the region of uniform magnetic fields. So let's put that down. So possibly the area is too large. So not all of the coil is in the region of uniform field strength. Next we've got the minimum impedance of the circuit below occurs when the frequency of the AC supply is zero and explain why this is so. Well the formula for the impedance of the circuit is that Z is equal to the square root of R squared plus XL squared. XL is omega times L or 2 pi FL. So when F is zero then XL will be zero and therefore in that case 
idea about it. Therefore, z will be equal to the square root of r squared, which is just r. And is a minimum. It's as small as it can possibly be. At any other stage, we would be adding on the impedance, uh, sorry, the reactance of the inductor to the impedance to give a bigger impedance than just r. Next, we've got to calculate the RMS current when the PD across the resistor and the inductor are the same. So, taking the same equation, Z equals R squared plus XL squared. If XL and R are equal, then we can say that Z is equal to the square root of 2 times R squared, or the square root of 2 times 82 squared. Looking at that on a calculator, we end up with about 116 ohms. Now we can calculate the current in the circuit using V over Z. These are RMS values. So we've got 12 over 116, which will give us 0 0.103, just to give an extra figure there. That will be in amps. For part C1, we've got to explain how resonance arises in the LCR circuit below. So it's basically the same circuit as before with the addition of a capacitor. And the point is, at resonance, XL and XC, the reactances of the inductor and the capacitor, will be equal and opposite. In other words, if we drew a phasor diagram, the phasor representing XL would be in the opposite direction to XC, given a resultant of zero in, if you like, the vertical direction, depends how we draw the diagram. I'll sketch one in a, a moment or two. And therefore, we would end up with Z just being equal to R. So let's just do a very quick phasor diagram. So what we tend to do with phasors, we tend to put the current and the resistance horizontally. Then we can use the word civil, which tells us for a capacitor, the current, which is also in this direction, leads to voltage. So the voltage across the capacitor and the capacitative reactance will be downwards. It's a bit of a terrible arrow there, but it doesn't matter. And the VIL bit tells you that for an inductor, V leads I, and therefore XL will be in this direction. So if XL and XC are equal to each other, we end up with Z just simply being R, Z being the impedance of the whole circuit there. So at a certain frequency, remember that XL is omega L and XC is 1 over omega C. If those two are equal to each other, we're going to get omega L is 1 over omega C and omega will be the square root of, sorry, 1 over the square root of, doesn't really matter. LC. So at that particular angular frequency, we're going to get resonance. We're going to calculate the power dissipated in the circuit at resonance. Well, we need to know that in the AC circuit at resonance, there's going to be no power in either the capacitor or the inductor. Um, we can simply use a power for the resistor. So we've got P equals V squared over R since we have the potential difference of 12 volts on the resistance of 82 ohms and that will give us 1.76 watts. Next we've got to calculate the RMS current when the frequency of the supply is 9.4 kilohertz and it was no longer at resonance. So we're going to do this in bits. First of all we're going to calculate XL which is omega L or 2 pi FL so it's 2 pi times 9.4 times 10 to the 3 times the 5.2 millihenries. And that gives us about 307 ohms. Similarly, Xc is 1 over 2 pi Fc. So it's 1 over 2 pi times the 9.4 times 10 to the 3 times the 220 nanofarads. 
and that gives us about 77 ohms. Next we're going to calculate the impedance of the circuit Z from the square root of R squared plus the difference between XL and XC squared. So it's going to be the square root of 82 squared plus 307 minus 77 squared which will give us about 244 ohms. And finally the RMS current is calculated from the RMS PD divided by Z so it's 12 over 244 which gives us about 0.049 amps. For the final part of the question we've got to discuss briefly the effectiveness of the given LCR circuit in providing a sharp resonance curve and they tell us that it may be useful to note that omega naught L over R is 1 over R root L over C and these are both formulas for the Q factor so let's use the second version of it so it's 1 over 82 root of 5.2 times 10 to the minus 3 for L and 220 times 10 to the minus 9 for C and that gives us 1.9 which is quite a low Q factor you're looking into at least sort of double figures for a reasonable Q factor and therefore the curve won't be sharp So thank you very much for listening. Please remember to like and subscribe and feel free to leave any comments. Goodbye.